Have you ever been told you have scoliosis because one of your shoulders is higher than the other? Have you heard that scoliosis is the cause of your back pain? Or maybe you have read that scoliosis can be fixed by performing specific exercises while avoiding others. Although this information might be well-intentioned, it's not entirely accurate. That's why in this video, I wanna discuss five important facts about scoliosis, which will hopefully dispel some common misconceptions out there and answer some common questions surrounding the topic. Let's start by looking at someone standing from behind. Can you say with 100% certainty that they have scoliosis? Or how about looking at their spine while they bend forward? Fact number one is that scoliosis cannot be diagnosed by simply observing someone's posture, whether this is standing or moving. While this may lead to suspicion, this alone is not diagnostic. Your spine curve must be measured via x-ray using what is called the Cobb angle, which is essentially an angle formed between the two most tilted vertebrae. The diagnosis of scoliosis is confirmed if this angle is 10 degrees or higher and axial rotation of the spine is present. The Cobb angle, your age, and the location of your curve, which is usually either the thoracic or lumbar region or both, are three criteria commonly used to classify idiopathic scoliosis. Idiopathic meaning the exact cause is unknown. This makes up about 80% of all cases, with the remaining 20% usually being classified by other conditions or causes as shown. Since the majority of scoliosis cases are idiopathic in adolescents or adults, the information in this video will pertain to these populations. So let's revisit someone's standing posture. While subtle differences in shoulder height, hip height, or even a torso lean might be observed in some people, this information alone does not define scoliosis. As you can see in the pictures, there are some cases where scoliosis might seem more obvious, but again, to confirm diagnosis, imaging with a Cobb angle greater than 10 degrees is still required. The big takeaway here is that some of you might have minor hip or shoulder asymmetries, which is normal, but does not necessarily mean you have scoliosis. Now for those adults or adolescents with true idiopathic scoliosis of varying degrees, there are usually some common questions you want answered. Shown is an image of a 23 year old female with moderate scoliosis, about a 25 degree Cobb angle. Over the next 30 years, do you think her curve is more likely to decrease, stay the same, or increase in severity? Fact number two, once you stop growing, it is very rare for scoliosis to progress. Now scoliosis curves will not decrease on their own, but they're also very unlikely to increase either. Here are some general thresholds. If you have a curve less than 10 degrees, remember, this is not scoliosis. Scoliosis curves less than 30 degrees will often remain stable throughout adulthood. Once curves get above 30 degrees, there is an increased risk for progression. And once you reach greater than 50 degrees, it is almost certain scoliosis curves will progress. This means that for adults with scoliosis of low to moderate severity, or about 10 to 30 degrees, your spinal curve is very unlikely to progress. With adolescents, when the spine is still growing, the Cobb angle will often guide treatment options. For example, if your curve is less than 25 degrees, observation is the primary intervention, meaning your spinal curve is watched closely for progression with your doctor determining the frequency of imaging. If your curve is between about 20 or 25 degrees and 40 or 45 degrees, bracing is often utilized in order to slow curve progression. With more severe cases, surgery might be warranted but this decision is multifactorial. This is unique to each individual. Other alternative treatments may promote a fix for scoliosis, but according to the Scoliosis Research Society, there's no scientific proof that any of these alternative treatments are effective in treating progressive scoliosis. And then there's the conversation of scoliosis-specific exercises, which brings us to fact number three. There's currently no best exercise for scoliosis. If you Google scoliosis specific exercises, you will find an array of exercise options, including breathing drills, fine stretches, postural exercises, back strengthening options, and so on. While these may help improve overall strength, 
increase function, and even provide symptom relief, the current research suggests that these scoliosis-specific exercises are not effective in reducing Cobb angle or preventing curve progression in adolescent scoliosis. And I think this is really important to understand because it helps set realistic expectations. Now, while you may find some studies demonstrating that it does improve spinal curves, if you look closely, these are usually deemed clinically insignificant, no more than four to six degrees. And as a whole, the current evidence on the topic is of very low quality. High quality research comparing scoliosis specific exercises to general exercise for the long-term management of idiopathic scoliosis is still needed. But there are still two positive takeaways here. The first is that exercise is still warranted for those with scoliosis, but it does not need to change Cobb angle or spinal curve to be considered successful, as they are still very beneficial for improving overall function and perceived status. And two, the exercise approach does not seem to make a significant difference. For example, a 2018 study found that general core stabilization exercises had similar effects in the short term when compared to scoliosis specific exercises. This suggests that any number of exercises are likely advantageous, whether this is Pilates, resistance training, or another type of exercise, this makes it far more likely you will find something accessible and that you enjoy, which in turn means you're much more likely to stick with it in the long term. Next question. Does someone with scoliosis of low to moderate severity have higher risk, same risk, or lower risk of developing back pain as someone without scoliosis? While higher risk seems like an obvious answer, these individuals actually have the same risk. According to the Scoliosis Research Society, adolescents with scoliosis get back pain at the same rate as their peers without scoliosis, and adults with curves less than 30 degrees have the same risk for back pain as people without scoliosis. This leads us to fact number four. Scoliosis of low to moderate severity does not cause back pain. While scoliosis might be correlated it is only one piece of a much larger puzzle. As you can see in this graphic, there are many potential factors associated with pain. Any number of these can contribute to symptoms. And that is why the saying correlation is not causation is so important in this context. This means that you do not necessarily need to decrease the scoliosis curve in order to reduce back pain. Instead, focus on addressing one or two of these factors which are in your control. For example, engaging in regular physical activity, reducing stress, and improving sleep are low-hanging fruits that can have a tremendous impact on both pain and function. And finally, fact number five, no exercise or activity is off limits. In their most recent guidelines, the International Society of Scoliosis, Orthopedic and Rehabilitation Treatment recommends patients with scoliosis to remain active in sport activities, especially since participation does not seem to affect their current or degree of scoliosis. You can run, swim, lift weights, or do whatever other activities you enjoy. You can even perform these at a high level. Take Lamar Gant, for example a world record holding power lifter who has scoliosis. Well, I've won 15 world titles. I've been competing for 20 consecutive years. I've deadlifted 639 as a 123 pounder, deadlifted 683 as a 132 pounder, and it keeps me healthy. I have scoliosis, so I always like to do things for my back and deadlifts, I think it's very, very good for the back or Jessica Ashwood, an Olympic swimmer and Australian record holder. The only thing I thought I can't do is be an Olympic swimmer with a twisted spine. But that's the funny thing about the word can't. It motivates you to do. Even Usain Bolt has been open about having scoliosis, attributing his hard work in developing a strong core and back as helping him throughout his career. So from all of this information, here are the big takeaways I want you to know about scoliosis. 
The first is that scoliosis cannot be diagnosed by only observing someone's standing or moving posture. Many people have told me that my shoulders are different heights and my spine is slightly crooked, but these minor asymmetries are quite common, they do not need to be corrected, and are generally nothing to be concerned about. Second, as an adult, it is very rare for idiopathic scoliosis of low to moderate severity to progress. It is unlikely you will need to seek out active treatment, but if you have any concerns, this should be a conversation you have with your medical doctor. And from this list of available treatments, there's not sufficient evidence to suggest that one form of exercise is significantly better than the other. Now, exercise is still highly encouraged in adolescents with idiopathic scoliosis, but limiting to scoliosis-specific exercises should not be a barrier to entry. The next takeaway is that scoliosis of low to moderate severity does not cause back pain. Understanding that there are multiple factors which contribute to pain will allow you to focus on factors that are in your control. Engaging in regular physical activity, reducing stress, and improving sleep are a few examples. And finally, no exercise or activity should be off limits. In fact, it is highly encouraged you remain active in sports and feel confident knowing these activities do not cause or make scoliosis curves worse. Now, I understand that some of you watching may have experiences that differ from the information presented, and that is okay. The purpose of this video is to provide the most up-to-date research and to highlight that individuals with scoliosis can still lead active, healthy lives. If you do have any other questions about scoliosis that I did not cover in today's video, I highly encourage that you talk to your medical doctor. As well, I put some resources down below in the description box, which will hopefully provide more guidance. Thanks for watching. I hope this video was helpful and answered some of your questions on the topic of scoliosis. Until next time.